You know what? Your praise is just sending out your faith. That's allowing God to just arrange things in your favor. I love that song that we were singing. Well, they're all good, but I like that one that says, I know who I am. If you're going to live in victory, you've got to know that you are a child of the Most High God. You are supposed to live a victorious life, an abundant life. You're not supposed to live under your circumstances. You're supposed to rise above your circumstances. You're supposed to reign in life, even like a, the scripture says, as a king. Joel Osteen has assumed the role of pastor at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, teaching his view of Christianity to around 38,000 people a week and to millions on television around the world. People who follow Joel Osteen or subscribe to his views may wonder why I have chosen to critique him. Well, there is great reason to question Osteen's teachings if it turns out that they are new teachings unknown to the Bible and the history of the Christian Church. In fact, if it turns out that his teachings are dangerous and heretical, then that must be made known for the sake of helping those caught in his snare. Many solid Christian leaders who study the history of the church and who study the Bible in Christian orthodoxy are warning people that Joel Osteen's teachings are heretical. For example, Dr. Michael Horton, the noted Christian professor at Westminster Seminary, stated the following in a CBS News segment about Osteen's teachings, quote, it is certainly heresy, I believe, to say that God is our resource for getting our best life now. It makes religion about us instead of about God." Unquote. If Dr. Horton is correct, as well as the many other Christian authorities who condemn Osteen's teachings as man-centered heresies such as Dr. John Piper, Dr. Steve Lawson, Dr. John MacArthur, Paul Washer, and many others, then this must be made clear. Since scripture is the word of God, and since the real Christian seeks to be true to what the Word of God teaches and what the Gospel teaches, it is important to expose those who distort the Gospel and present a false message. Some may think that by critiquing Osteen's teachings, I am being judgmental or causing unnecessary divisions. However, such a view comes from a misreading and abuse of Matthew 7, 1, which says, Judge not, lest ye be judged. We all know the phrase. This is the most well-known verse amongst the unbelieving world and will often be brought up whenever anyone seeks to show that someone is not acting in line with scripture, be it with respect to sin or false teaching. However, when one reads the context of Matthew 7, 1, instead of merely isolating the verse, you will see that it's talking about not making specific hypocritical judgments when you're guilty of the exact same sin or false teaching. Matthew 7, 1 to 6 states, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you." Unquote. Notice that you're not to judge someone or rebuke them if you're guilty of the same thing they are. For example, if I saw my friend gambling, and then said he was wrong for doing it, while I was doing it as well, then I would be guilty of hypocritical judgments. That's what Matthew 7, 1 is about, nothing more. However, notice also that Christ says to first take the log out of your own eye and then judge afterwards. Since I am not guilty of Osteen's errors and hence am without a log in my eye on this point, I have the biblical authority to judge him as either incorrect or correct and critique him. Notice also that in the very context, Jesus is judging people himself for their hypocrisy and even calls them dogs and pigs, showing that he is not condemning all judging in the strict sense only hypocritical judgments. 
Therefore, this text is not saying to never judge or critique anyone in any situation. That's a horrible misuse of the text. I will now provide the biblical basis for judging. John 7.24 states, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment." Unquote. 2 Timothy 4.2 also states, quote, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Notice here that in order to reprove or rebuke or exhort someone, you first have to judge them as to whether or not they need to be reproved, rebuked, or exhorted. The same goes with Titus 2.15, except here it says, Don't let anyone disregard you when you rebuke false teachers, it states. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Again, in order to know if someone needs to be rebuked or exhorted, you have to judge the matter and see if what they are saying or doing is in line with scripture. You have to judge. And finally, 1 Corinthians 2.15 states, The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Therefore, this notion that we should never judge anyone is unknown to the Bible. The only people who teach that Christians should never judge or critique anyone are those ignorant of the Bible or those who do not like to be told that they are either in sin or believing false teachings. So let us begin our examination. Joel Osteen will readily admit that his teaching is void of any orthodox exhortations about the reality of sin in the human heart. Sin that separates us from God deeming us guilty, showing that we need a savior. It then follows that since he admittedly doesn't talk about sin, then he also doesn't talk about repentance or turning from sin, which is a necessary condition for salvation. Instead, Osteen's message is aimed at human prosperity, appeasing man, telling people that they can have their best life now, with respect to temporal carnal fulfillment, that God's purpose is giving you all your dreams and desires, and that the purpose of the Christian life is asking or telling God to make your life better with respect to possessions or material wealth. He teaches that we should seek to reap the supposed reward that God has for everyone here now on earth, as opposed to the biblical message which says, now is the time to submit to Christ's Lordship, seeking holiness, for our reward is not physical possessions, but is instead eternal life and spiritual blessings in heaven. Here in Matthew 5.12, Jesus says that although we live in a fallen world of persecution and evil, quote, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven." Unquote. Now, many people who have studied the God-centered New Testament will immediately recognize how man-centered Osteen's teachings are and how they omit the very core of the gospel, namely, that people are born depraved sinners who need to repent of their sin, receiving Christ as Lord. The Bible further condemns those who would claim to be born-again believers and yet use God as a means of attaining wealth and prosperity since by doing so, they are yoking themselves up with the world. You ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Go now, ye rich men, weep and howl in your miseries, which shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rest of them shall be for a testimony against you, and shall eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up to yourselves wrath against the last days." Unquote. The emphasis of Christianity is not material gain or physical carnal happiness or pleasure, but the gift of eternal life and salvation from hell. A transformation from a life of sin to a life of submission to Christ and growing in God. Blessings do come to the Christians at times, but this is not the focus of Christianity. However, what is extremely troubling is the way in which Osteen presents how someone can attain this better life he promises to his congregation. He teaches a dangerous and heretical doctrine that has heretical roots, known as the Word of Faith teaching, or the Name It and Claim It theology. With Osteen and others like him, it all boils down to this. He teaches that man has the power within himself to speak things into existence, such as material gain, or a prosperous life of finance with your words 
or that if you think of a positive goal in your mind, it will result in it becoming a reality. This is called the Law of Attraction, a very dangerous occult belief, Osteen states. The power of words, your words affect your future." Unquote. This is why his teaching is called Word of Faith, telling people that they can affect their own future and receive material blessings by saying words or thinking certain thoughts is not a biblical teaching. It is selfish, man-centered, not God-centered theology. The Bible says the Christian goal is to glorify God with their life, not exalt themselves or make God the genie in a bottle who submits to their demands of prosperity. Here is an example of Osteen incorporating this Law of Attraction teaching into his sermons. Now get up and say, this is going to be a great day. I'm excited about my future. Something good is going to happen to me. You've got to send your words out in the direction you want your life to go. Words are like seeds. When you speak them out, if you continue to believe them and listen to them, they can come to a reality in your life. He also states, quote, like a magnet, we draw in what we are constantly thinking about, unquote. With respect to how one achieves material success or happiness in this earthly life, Osteen states, quote, believe, visualize, and speak out loud, unquote. Now, any biblical student who knows church history and early church belief might be asking, what is this that Osteen is teaching? Where does this teaching come from? This prosperity word of faith theology, name it and claim it, or think and speak positive and you will get what your heart desires belief, is actually an old New Age occult concept known as the Law of Attraction, or Thought Power, as I mentioned. And its origins are not Christian. This belief comes from the New Thought movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as the mystics of the New Age Theosophical Society in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was then picked up by much of the New Age movement as a whole. You may recognize the phrase Law of Attraction from the movie The Secret, which came out in 2006, and this film is based on the same principle. That film and its teachings were and are highly endorsed by the influential New Age television host Oprah Winfrey, who is heavily involved with the occult. The show, this is what I've been trying to do. It is the secret to creating the life you truly want. Make more money, lose weight, fall in love, land your dream job. Isn't that amazing? This is life changing. I'm ready for that, yeah. Okay, now the choir's going. Jump in, anybody. Find out the secret and see why people everywhere are talking about it. When, when I heard that it. for the first time, my eyes watered. Now, this law of attraction belief is also endorsed by New Age guru and author Deepak Chopra, who denies Christianity. Notice how similar Joel Osteen's Word of Faith Thought Power teachings are to the Law of Attraction teachings found in the New Age movie The Secret, even when it comes down to the magnet analogy that Joel Osteen used. You know this secret gives you everything you want. Happiness, health, and wealth. You can have, do, or be anything you want. We can have whatever it is that we choose. I don't care how big it is. What kind of a house do you want to live in? Do you want to be a millionaire? What kind of a business do you want to have? Do you want more success? What do you really want? One law. It's attraction. The simplest way for me to look at the, the law of attraction is if I think of myself as a magnet, and I know that a magnet will attract to it. Our job as humans is to hold on to the thoughts of what we want, make it absolute clear in our minds what we want, and from that we start to invoke one of the greatest laws in the universe, and that's the law of attraction. You, you, you become what you think about most, but you also attract what you think about most. And that principle can be summed up in three simple words. Thoughts become things. Now get up and say, this is going to be a great day. I'm excited about my future. Something good is going to happen to me. You've got to send your words out in the direction you want your life to go. Notice that in this man-centered teaching, there is nothing about Christ or the Bible, and yet Joel Osteen teaches it. Osteen doesn't inform his viewers that this is what he is teaching them, 
He just teaches it as if it is Christianity, thereby deceiving many to think it's actually biblical Christianity. He has included this false heretical law of attraction belief into his teachings, applying it to the Bible, thereby introducing modern New Age metaphysical concepts into the church and distorting the true biblical gospel, diluting it of its meaning and original message. We will talk about why this unbiblical belief not found in scripture is dangerous and what it results in, but let us first examine some more of its origins to see the gravity of the situation. So where did Osteen, Oprah Winfrey, Deepak Chopra in the movie The Secret get this view from? This view can be traced back to a New Age organization called the Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society was a group of New Age mystics who firmly believed and taught that Lucifer was the true God or Messiah. The Theosophical Society was founded by Helena Blavatsky who said, but in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferus is the name of the angelic entity presiding over the light of truth as over the light of the day. Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. And now it stands proven that Satan or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus and Lucifer or light bearer is in us. It is our mind." Unquote. Helena Blavatsky and Blavatsky's students believed that Satan was God denied the truth of Jesus Christ, as well as the gospel. The Theosophical Society grew into what we now call the New Age movement of today, as their teachings about the New Age of Aquarius spread. Now, when I found out that it was actually these early Theosophists who popularized what Joel Osteen is now teaching, I was truly at awe. With respect to Osteen's teaching that types of thoughts, be they good or bad, attract types of results, be they good or bad, i.e. the law of attraction, Blavatsky wrote the following in 1887, quote, It is the universal law which is understood by Plato and explained in Timaeus as the attraction of lesser bodies to larger ones and of similar bodies to similar, the latter exhibiting a magnetic power rather than following the law of gravitation, unquote. Blavatsky's New Age Luciferian occultist students, such as Annie Besant, also taught and popularized this law of attraction, positive thought, Joel Osteen belief. Besant wrote the following in 1903, quote, This is the secret of right receptivity. The mind responds according to its constitution. It answers to all that is of like nature with itself. We make it positive towards evil, negative towards good. By habitual good thinking, thus building into its very fabric materials that are receptive of good, unreceptive of evil. We must think of that which we desire to receive, and refuse to think of that which we desire not to receive." Unquote. This is where Joel Osteen's power of thought belief stems from. Notice how man-centered this occult New Age belief is. We must think of what we desire to receive. Where is Christ or submission to holiness in all of this? The emphasis of this teaching is selfish fulfillment of one's carnal desires and dreams, using their own mental power of thought to attain it, when, in contrast, the Bible that Christians are ordered to follow exhorts Christians to submit to the Lordship of Christ in all things, dying to self and dying to worldly desires. 1 John 2, 15-17 states, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever." Unquote. Hence, why are pastors like Osteen making it their duty to tell people to use this occult power of thought belief to attain things of the world that the Bible orders Christians not to focus on? In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 36, it asks, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Unquote. So again, one must ask this crucial question. Why does a pastor of a mega church teach what is contrary to scripture and what comes from the New Age movement of the 19th century? We will go more into that later. Now, regarding further origins of this belief, William Walker Atkinson, born 1862 and died in 1932, was also a New Age occultist and he drew his teachings from the false religion of Hinduism. 
he helped popularize the law of attraction or thought power belief into American thinking as well. Teachings that eventually found their way into Joel Osteen's pulpit. The occultist Atkinson wrote, quote, We speak learnedly of the law of gravitation, but ignore that equally wonderful manifestation, the law of attraction, in the thought world. We are familiar with that wonderful manifestation of law, which draws and holds together the atoms of which matter is comprised. We recognize the power of the law that attracts bodies to earth, that holds the circling worlds in their places, but we close our eyes to the mighty law that draws to us the things we desire or fear that makes or mars our lives." Unquote. This is exactly what Joel Osteen is teaching his church to do. The same occult philosophy of people who believed in the occult, the New Age, and Luciferianism. Yet he doesn't inform his congregation about where these thought power teachings come from. Instead of informing those under him that his teachings come from people who believed Satan was the true God, and that man's goal is to live for himself in a selfish manner, using thought power to attain material success, Osteen just teaches this thought power doctrine, as if Jesus taught such a thing. Joel Osteen is not preaching Christianity, he's preaching New Age occultism. Commenting on the link between Osteen's teachings and the occult notion of law of attraction and thought power, Dr. Ronald Bish notes the following in his work Jesus, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, quote, For Rhonda Burney, the genie is the law of attraction. For Joel Osteen, it's the word of faith. And so he's committed to the notion that faith is a force, that words are the container's force, and through the force of faith, you can create your own reality, unquote. This New Age law of attraction belief was also taught long ago by heretical false anti-Christian people such as Phineas P. Quimby and Mary Baker Eddy of the late 19th century, and it slowly found its way into Christian churches after the 19th century, becoming what is now known today as the Word of Faith Movement, or Prosperity Gospel Message, present in Joel Osteen's sermons. Essek W. Kenyon, born 1867, died in 1948, incorporated this satanic man-centered belief into Christian churches, and it resulted in final acceptance since so many followed after him. Now much of the church believes this self-help, think positive thought power message to be the gospel, when it is actually counterproductive to the truth of Christianity, which has always emphasized submission to the Lordship of Christ, denial of self, and denial of worldliness. This belief wants you to focus on worldliness and attain the material possessions and happiness your heart desires using thought power, except this time, you combine God with thought power, and you will get everything you want. This kind of teaching appeals to natural, carnal, sinful people who want material possessions as opposed to giving up worldliness to submit to God as the Bible commands. However, Osteen's beliefs are revolting to real biblical Christians who follow Jesus when he said in Matthew 16, 24, quote, Anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, unquote. This unbiblical, worldly, occult, New Age, name it and claim it, law of attraction belief was then promoted by popular preacher Kenneth Hagin, which then sadly gave this type of doctrine more prominence and acceptance in the church setting. Now I tell people all the time, if you're not satisfied with what you have, you've created it yourself. I know you laid it on somebody else, but you created it yourself. Well, if you're not satisfied with what you have, quit believing what you're believing and saying what you're saying. And start believing what you want created and saying what you, you, you want done. And it will become. All things are possible to him. Now shut your eyes and say it out loud. Listen to your own voice as you say it. All things are possible to him that believes. Say it again. All things are possible to him that believes. Say this, and I believe. I now let's say it together. All things are possible to him that believeth, and I believe. All things are possible to him that believeth, and I believe. Say it again. Such modern false teachers who now corrupt the church with this poisonous false doctrine include T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and of course Joel Osteen, and many others. That as these programs are airing, I am speaking something into existence. Therefore, when Osteen teaches people that God wants you to use thought power to attain material success, possessions, and happiness, he is not teaching Christianity. 
He is merely repeating the occult law of attraction thought power beliefs that slowly crept in and corrupted the church in the last 125 years or so. You will never find such a teaching in the Christian church before that because the Bible doesn't teach such a heresy. Now, aside from the fact that the Bible nowhere teaches this thought power doctrine or that man creates his own destiny, as I mentioned, Osteen admits that he doesn't ever talk about sin or hell, and therefore it follows that it's impossible for him to then talk about repentance, which is a turning away from sin or submission to Christ in that regard, as the Bible commands. The following comments from Osteen demonstrate that he is not qualified to be a pastor or Bible teacher and that he doesn't understand the necessary components of the gospel or how to be saved. Quote, I think for years there's been a lot of hellfire and damnation. You go to church to figure out what you're doing wrong and you leave feeling bad, like you're not going to make it, Osteen said. We believe in focusing on the goodness of God. Critics say, mega church's party-like atmosphere takes spirituality out of Sunday services. It tends to be a guilt-free, sin-free environment said Woodward. These places are a bit too bubbly. It's very chummy with God." Unquote. The problem with Osteen not talking about sin or hell is that without doing so, you can't accurately give the gospel to anyone, and so no one is truly saved from listening to Osteen. You see, in order to be saved, according to the Bible, you need to know why you need to be saved. The biblical definition of being saved means inheriting eternal life, and being saved from hell and the sinful ways of this wicked generation. If you don't explain how God hates sin or tell people that they are born sinners who are under the wrath of God for violating his laws since they were young, and that Jesus died taking the wrath of God we deserve, and that through faith in that work on the cross and repentance or a turning away from sin we can be saved, then you're not giving the gospel. If you don't tell them that, they don't know the truth. You end up teaching people that Jesus is only a savior in the sense that he will save your failing life here and now and give you earthly success and material possessions. That's not the gospel. Romans 5.8 states, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Luke 13.3 which states, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unquote. Therefore, when the Bible gives the gospel, it mentions sin and it commands people to repent of sin and submit to or obey the gospel. So why doesn't Joel Osteen teach that? And plus, Jesus talked about hell more than anything else in his sermons, as well as the necessity of giving up worldliness and submitting to him. Why doesn't Joel Osteen do this? Gerhardus Voss elaborates on Christ's message of recognizing our sin, repenting or truly turning away from it, and then submitting to Christ, quote, our Lord's idea of repentance is as profound and comprehensive as his conception of righteousness. Of the three words that are used in the Greek Gospels to describe the process, one emphasizes the emotional element of regret, sorrow over the past evil course of life, metomelame. A second expresses reversal of the entire mental attitude, metanoium. The third denotes a change in the direction of life, one goal being substituted for another, epistrephomai. Repentance is not limited to any single faculty of the mind. It engages the entire man, intellect, will, and affections. Again, in the new life which follows repentance, the absolute supremacy of God is the controlling principle. He who repents turns away from the service of mammon and self to the service of God." Unquote. To not include this in your gospel presentation, as Osteen fails to do, is to not give the gospel at all. And so what you're left with is a dead church who knows nothing of the truth. When Osteen teaches people that they can essentially be their own independent powerful master and create their own reality or success by thinking or talking things into existence, Osteen is contradicting the New Testament fact that Christians are slaves to Christ, the true master, and that Christians submit to his will, not their own desires or worldly passions and hopes. As Dr. John MacArthur states, the as Dr. John MacArthur states, the idea of the Christian as a slave and Christ as master is almost totally missing from the vocabulary of contemporary evangelical Christianity. Not only is slave a bad word loaded with political incorrectness, 
but our generation also loves the concepts of freedom and personal fulfillment. Modern and postmodern people crave autonomy, and as the church has become increasingly worldly, the biblical truth of our duty to Him as our absolute Lord and Master has all but disappeared from the evangelical consciousness. The church in our generation has reduced all of saving faith and Christian discipleship to a thoughtless but more politically correct cliché, a personal relationship with Jesus. The ambiguity of the phrase reflects the destructive vagueness with which evangelicals have been handling and mishandling the gospel for the past several decades, as if Christ could be someone's intimate friend without being the person's Lord. Consider what this truth would mean for the prosperity gospel, the idea that Christians have the power to create health, wealth, and material success with their own words, which promises the fulfillment of felt needs and the achievement of personal satisfaction as incentives for responding to Christ, or the elusive quest for a brand of faith that guarantees your best life now. All of these ideas are at odds with the biblical principle that Christians are slaves who are totally subject to the will of another, namely Christ, who is their absolute master." Unquote. Now, when Osteen teaches that we create our own reality, and that we can use thought power to influence God getting him to yield to our will and provide us with material gain, what is implicit in that message is that our words are aimed at making sure our own will is accomplished, that we get what our will desires. However, as opposed to using thought power to attain what our wills want, Jesus gives us the example of how Christians are to pray for God's will to be done, not ours, when he said this to the Father, quote, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, Luke 22, 42. Thus, we need to emulate this method instead of using occult power of thought techniques to try to get our corrupt wills accomplished. In fact, the Bible knows nothing of a God who folds to the demands of his creatures if they tell him to give them prosperity. The true biblical God is completely sovereign and he does what he wants to do. Isaiah 46, 9-10 states, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes." Unquote. Now, as I have researched this issue, it has become clear that Satan uses Joel Osteen's teachings for his evil purposes. Consider the following teaching from Osteen, and how it could potentially cause one of his followers to be prideful and ignore the rebuke from a real Christian who would exhort them to repent of their sin and submit to Christ changing their ways as God commands. Osteen teaches, You have to learn to follow your heart. You can't let other people pressure you into being something that you're not. If you want God's favor in your life, you must be the person he made you to be, not the person your boss wants you to be, not even the person your parents or your husband wants you to be. You can't let outside expectations keep you from following your own heart." Unquote. You see, if people were to follow what Osteen is saying here, there's a big chance that they would ignore real pastors or real Christians who would exhort the person to repent of their sin and submit to Christ as opposed to seeking worldly fulfillment and material gain. The person would think the true Christian was telling them to be something they are not, and by taking Osteen's advice they might refuse to listen to that biblical message of repentance and changing our sinful ways, and would probably take such a reproach as a negative message, ignore it, and continue asking God for material possessions instead, not realizing that by doing so, they are rejecting the very gospel Jesus preached. If you give praises to God, then why, why won't Joel preach repentance? Why won't Joel, answer me this, why won't Joel preach repentance? When is the last time you heard, when's the last time you heard Joel mention sin? Moreover, when Osteen tells his congregation to follow their own heart, as opposed to what others may tell them, even if it is biblical repentance and exhortation, he forgets to mention that, quote, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it, unquote, as Jeremiah 17, 9 states. People must understand that Christians who take God and his biblical revelation seriously do not follow their own heart. They realize that their heart is naturally corrupt due to the imputation of sin nature that we get at birth 
because of the fall of mankind. So instead of relying on our corrupt hearts, that are tainted by the fall of Adam and Eve to love sin and worldliness, we need to rely on the teaching of God-breathed, inspired scripture for our guidance. Scripture is pure, our hearts are not. And in the Holy Scriptures, we read that we are not to believe in God just so we can attain worldly success or material possessions. We are to put off our old self and strive for holiness to honor Christ since he died for our sins and forgives those who truly repent and believe in him. God doesn't owe us anything. Now, if we claim to believe in Christ, and yet we only superficially do so for the purpose of getting things from God, we won't be saved. Consider the following biblical evidence that affirms this. In Philippians 3, 18-19, Paul describes people who, instead of submitting to Christ whether they get dealt pain or pleasure, have their minds set on the things of this world, like wealth and material possessions. Paul identifies such people as enemies of the cross, quote, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things, unquote. If you're going to live in victory, you've got to know that you are a child of the Most High God. You are supposed to live a victorious life, an abundant life. Therefore, those like Joel Osteen and those under him, whose true God or idol is their own temporary earthly satisfaction, are enemies of the cross, according to the Apostle Paul. Because they have their minds set on earthly things, such as their best life now, instead of heavenly things like submitting to Christ, their end will be destruction. Their end will be hell. Now, when Osteen tells people that God's main purpose for Christians is to have their best life now and enjoy luxury and success, as opposed to striving to put away sin and obeying Christ, Osteen is repeating the error of the Nicolaitans that Jesus condemned in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2, 6-7 and 15-16 states, Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth." Unquote. So here Jesus, speaking through the Apostle John, says that he hates the works of the Nicolaitans and that the Nicolaitans need to repent or else they will go to hell for all eternity. The question is, what did the Nicolaitans do and teach that made Christ so angry with them? The answer is given to us by Christians in the early church who wrote about the Nicolaitans, such as Tertullian and Hippolytus of Rome, who stated, But Nicolaus has been a cause of the widespread combination of these wicked men. Nicolaus departed from correct doctrine and was in the habit of inculcating indifferency of both life and food." Unquote. Let us see then, whether it be a just one, not as if we aimed at destroying the happiness of sanctity, as do certain Nicolaitans in their maintenance of lust and luxury, but as those who have come to the knowledge of sanctity and pursue it and prefer it without detriment." Unquote. Here we see that the people Jesus said he hated the works of, the people who he ordered to repent, were people who professed to know Christ but instead of turning their back on worldliness, they maintained a life of luxury and exalted this life now as opposed to realizing that this life is temporary and that our goal should be to live a holy godly life instead of focusing on selfish desires. This is exactly what Joel Osteen and his church are guilty of. They are modern day Nicolaitans that Christ abhors. This further shows why Osteen should not be teaching anyone or be assuming the role of pastor of a church in fact, he is not even qualified to pastor a church, for when he was asked if Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation, a basic fundamental Christian truth that the church has always affirmed, on the Larry King Live show, he said the following, And keep in mind, Christianity has always taught that everyone is born dead in sin, guilty of breaking God's law, worthy of hell, and that unless they receive the only way of salvation, which is in Christ's sacrifice for their sins, and repent, bearing evidence of salvation with a new way of life, they will go to hell. Phoenix, Arizona, hello. 
Hello, Larry. You're the best. And thank you, Joe, Joel, for your positive messages and your book. I'm wondering, though, um, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. Um, the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way to the Father is through him. That's not really a message of condemnation, but of truth. Yeah, I would agree with her. I believe that. So then That's a what Jew is not going to hell. No, I, I, I mean, well, no, here's my thing, Larry, is I can't judge somebody's heart, you know. I don't know. Only God can look at somebody's heart. And so, I don't know. I just, to me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is or this one isn't. I'm just saying, here's what the Bible teaches, and I want to put my faith in, uh, you know, in Christ. And I, I just, I think it's wrong when we go around saying, you know, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, because it's not exactly my way. I'm just, I'm but not going to be the God. you believe your way. I believe my way. I believe my way with all my heart. But For uh, someone who doesn't share it, well, it is wrong, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean. Well, I don't know if I look at it like that. I would, I would present my way, but I'm just going to let God be the judge of that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. So you make no judgment on anyone? No, but I... About atheists? No, I just, you know what? I let, I let someone, let, I'm going to let God be the judge of who goes to heaven and hell. And I just, again, I present the truth. And I say it every week, you know, I believe it's a relationship with Jesus. But, you know, I'm not going to go around telling everybody else. If, if they don't want to believe that, that's going to be their choice. God's got to look at your own heart. God's got to look at your heart. From this, it's quite clear that Osteen should be seen as a false teacher, a wolf in sheep's clothing, since he clearly said, with respect to atheists and Jews who refuse to submit to Christ, that he will not tell them that unless they receive Christ, they'll go to hell. Because, and this is his excuse, only God knows the heart. This presupposes that an atheist's heart can be good enough to merit God's favor and enter heaven, and so therefore we do not need to warn them that they will go to hell without Christ. However, the Bible says that all men fall short and sin, and so unless they repent and receive Christ, they will go to hell. Scripture clearly rejects Osteen's comments, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God." Unquote. John 3.18 Not telling people this is very dangerous, because without Christ, they will have to pay for their own sin, and no one can. They will pay for it in hell. Therefore, when Joel Osteen refuses to tell people that unless they believe in Christ and live their life for him, they are condemned to hell, he is not teaching Christianity correctly. However, it is not surprising that false teachers like Osteen are popular amongst those who hate the truth and wish to use religion for material gain and worldly success since the Bible predicted such things would take place in the church. People who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. As for you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, unquote. They choose as a way to slap God, to get back at God. You have a loved one who dies, a boyfriend who deserts you. Something happens in life that you don't get your way. And you get mad at God because some crazy Nimnu Sunday School teacher told you that God owed you a long life, straight teeth, a clear complexion, thinness, happiness, and nothing would ever go wrong with you as long as you believe in God. See, this is the message. If you accept Jesus, everything will be wonderful. What a crop! When you accept Jesus, you then initiate a war and the devil going to be mad. So all hell breaks out when you accept Jesus.
Because Osteen is teaching an unbiblical doctrine, and because he is teaching it to a supposed Christian audience, it follows naturally that he must then twist the Bible to suit his purposes. For, if the Bible doesn't teach his false view, then he has to try to make it teach it by distorting certain texts in order to sound like they support prosperity teaching. And this is exactly what Joel Osteen does in almost every sermon or self-help seminar he preaches. When speaking to his self-esteem cult, he not only encourages the occult New Age power of thought law of attraction heresy that we learned was invented by anti-Christian occultists, but he also pretends to explicitly know God's purpose for everyone's life when he states, God wants us to live consistently. He wants us to enjoy every single day of our lives." Unquote. However, it is not possible to know that God's purpose for every Christian is to enjoy every single day. In fact, there are biblical problems with this. For example, it is well known that when a Christian slips up into a sin, if they are truly saved, God will chastise the person in numerous ways to correct them to not repeat this error. This means that that day is not a day of enjoyment, as Osteen claims, but a day or period of chastisement and punishment, learning not to repeat this sin. Here is some biblical support for this fact. 2 Samuel 7.14 I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Proverbs 3.11 my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights." Unquote. Moreover, Christians understand that the Christian life is not day-to-day -day carnal enjoyment, as Osteen says. It is in fact war with sin, if in fact you are truly saved. The Apostle Paul brings this out in 2 Timothy 4, 6-7. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith." Unquote. Similarly, after the apostles realized how costly it was to be a disciple or follower of Christ, in that you have to forsake sin and a life of worldliness, they asked Jesus how to be saved if there are only few who will be saved. In Luke 13:24. Jesus tells the Christians that the Christian life involves an intense struggle to strive to enter the kingdom because many try and are not able. This doesn't sound like a day-to-day -day carnal life of enjoyment as Osteen teaches, quote, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able, unquote. Luke 13:24. Now, you may be shocked to learn that in the entire New Testament, you will never find it stated that receiving the gospel will result in your best life now, or a life of bliss and happiness. In fact, the Bible teaches the polar opposite, and so before I refute Osteen's misuse of certain texts that he twists trying to make them say God wants everyone to be wealthy and materially successful as our goal, let me first show you what the Bible actually teaches about the cost of being a true disciple or follower of Christ. Far from promising a life of bliss for those that believe on Christ, the Bible actually teaches that the original followers of Christ, the apostles, as well as the early church, forsook worldliness and were extremely persecuted for their exclusive faith in Christ, showing just how erroneous Osteen's views are. For example, the apostles lived harsh lives of missionary trips, suffered mockery, persecution, and eventually death. They understood that Christianity was not about using God to attain temporary material gain or superficial happiness, but they instead realized that Christ's words were true in Matthew 10, 38-39, when he said that anyone who doesn't take up their cross, meaning forsake their sinful life of carnal selfish temptations, is not worthy of Christ. And also, Christ said that if your goal is to gain material success and temporary happiness, finding a satisfactory worldly life, you will lose your life in the end, in hell." Quote, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Notice the implication. If you lose your life, meaning if you forsake living for yourself and for material gain, you will inherit eternal life, because by forsaking worldliness, 
you demonstrate that you're truly saved and regenerate with a new mind. But if you follow Osteen and use God to get rich or find a life full of carnal worldly joy, you will go to hell since it proves you're not saved or regenerate, but are still instead desiring what unregenerate unsaved people desire. We are to deny ourselves and follow holiness instead, as Christ commanded in Luke 9.23, quote, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, unquote. Such teachings are never given to Osteen's congregation because if he did speak about such things, they would all realize that he was leading them astray and away from Jesus' true message. The Apostle Paul also stated, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily, unquote. 1 Corinthians 15.31 Notice, instead of striving for a life of material or carnal joy and happiness with respect to finance or possessions, as Osteen teaches, Paul's example is that we are to die daily to our fleshly desires and temptations of all kinds and submit to Christ fighting sin as our goal instead. Now, naturally at this point, many of Osteen's carnal followers and others who think like them might say, if this is how Christianity really is, then I don't want it. To that I say, fine, stop calling yourself a Christian and giving the truth a bad name then. Become an atheist or a new ager and be honest with yourself. Now, when people like Osteen see texts that talk about having peace or happiness in the Christian life, they assume that it is about relishing and enjoying material possessions or finance that he believes God deals out to all who believe in him. However, that's not true. The peace or joy that comes in the Christian life is an appreciation or joy over inheriting eternal life, knowing the truth and knowing Jesus Christ, and receiving the gift of suffering for Christ, in that as new Christians we have been given a new nature that wars with the sin our flesh loves. And this struggle, or striving for holiness, is suffering. And with respect to this gift of being able to suffer for Christ, Philippians 1.29 states, For it has been granted to you, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake." Unquote. It is in this sense that we have joy and peace. We understand that by God's gracious gift, we are now able to hate sin and suffer in struggling to not be conformed to this world. Our peace and joy is not based on worldly temporal finance or job security, possessions or luxury. We have received eternal life and the ability to not love the things of the world like we used to. That is the sense in which we have joy and peace in Christianity. Our joy and peace is Christ. Now that we have seen that scripture does not teach the prosperity gospel, let us now examine how horribly Osteen twists scripture to try to make it teach that. After telling his congregation that they are supposed to reign like kings and live in expectancy with respect to finance and material gain, he says, You know, God can do what men can't do. It may look impossible to you, but it's not impossible with God. Jesus put it so simple. If you believe, all things are possible. I believe I'm looking at believers and not doubters today. You know God can do supernatural things. The verse he quoted was Mark 9.23, which says, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes, unquote. However, again, the context here is not about using thought power, believing you will be rich, and then getting rich because of the law of attraction. The context here is that a man brought his boy to Jesus, who was a mute and demon-possessed. One of the apostles was not able to exercise the demon, and so in verse 17 to 18, the boy is brought to Jesus. It is in that context that Jesus says to the boy's father that if you believe, all things are possible. Jesus then healed the boy for him. This is with respect to overcoming things that are ungodly like demons or things that are contrary to Christianity and holiness. By faith and trust in Christ, this overcoming of evil can be attained. And so in verse 29, when Jesus explained to the apostles that if they want to be able to cast out demons and things like this, they must fast and pray, demonstrating that they have true faith. Once this is accomplished, then they could do all things like cast out demons, do miracles, and all kinds of related things to this. Again, this is not talking about superficially believing and then receiving material success or possessions and wealth. That is another distortion of the text. Here is another example where Osteen endorses his wife's twisting of scripture. I love the scripture that says God takes pleasure when his people prosper. 
Today, God is pleased when you're doing well. He's pleased when you're succeeding. He's pleased when you're whole and healthy and happy in Him. So know this, if you've got some things going wrong, that's not God. God wants to do good things for you. He wants to turn the tide of the battle in your life. He wants to put you on the road to success. God is for you, and if He be for you, who dare be against you this morning? Amen? God is for us today. Here the woman misquotes and misapplies Psalm 35, 27, which states, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of His servant, unquote. She wants people to believe that when you use thought power and attain worldly carnal success or finance, that it is God doing that and He takes pleasure when His people prosper financially or with material success. However, that's not what this is about. It doesn't say God takes pleasure when His people prosper. It says God takes pleasure in the welfare or prosperity of His servant, David. The context of this chapter is that David's enemies were fighting against him, verse 1. He wished that those who devise evil against him be put to shame, verse 4. David wishes for destruction on them who persecute him, verse 8. He seeks for salvation from his persecution, verse 9. He wishes to be rescued from their destruction, verse 17. In verses 23 and 24, he pleads for vindication from this situation of persecution and seeks peace and to be seen as the good righteous man he is by the people who are lying about him. In verse 26, David asks that they be put to shame, those who rejoice over David's calamity. And then we get verse 27, the verse in question saying, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. So the context is that the welfare God is rejoicing over is David's welfare of going from being persecuted to being at peace having many shout for joy about David's righteousness or holiness. That is the prosperity or welfare David says God is rejoicing over. It's with respect to David's persecutors and enemies being smitten and him being shown not to be evil as they were saying, but him being seen as the righteous man he was. This isn't talking about God's purpose for everyone's life being financial prosperity or material gain and then God rejoicing when you strive for that as your goal. That is a total misuse of the context. The Hebrew word for prosperity or welfare there that God rejoices over is shalom, and it does not mean financial or material success or gain. It's a word, quote, used to encourage one who is fearful and to assure him of peace. In this sense, there is nothing for you to fear. Thou art in safety, shalom, unquote, as Jesenius' Hebrew lexicon affirms. Therefore, this is about peace in the midst of persecution and it's about David specifically. It's not about God rejoicing when you ask him for a new car and then receive it. That's not the kind of welfare or prosperity it is talking about. Here's another example of Osteen twisting scripture. You know, there's so many things trying to talk us into having a down year, but every time you come out here, I'm gonna talk you into having a great year. You gotta know that, like Victoria said, if God be for us, who dare be against us? Here Osteen quotes Romans 8.31 which says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He takes this text to mean that although there are many things that want us to have a down year, we should expect a great year because God is for us. That is his interpretation. However, when you apply proper hermeneutics or principles of interpretation to the end of Romans 8, you will see that this text is not saying God is for us in the sense that he will make sure we have a good year or prosperous life. The context actually states that since Christians are predestined to heaven, we do not have to fear death, persecution, or hatred from the world because even if we suffer, God is for us and we will go to heaven. Here's the context Osteen omits. Romans 8, 29-39 For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. 
We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am sure of this, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord." Unquote. So therefore, the all things God promises for those who love him are heavenly things in the afterlife in Christ Jesus our Lord. Unquote. So therefore, the all things God promises for those who love him are heavenly things in the afterlife. And God is for us in the sense that we will never be separated from his love even if we are killed, if we suffer, if we're persecuted, etc. It's in that sense, and in that sense alone, that God is for us in this chapter. It is not saying God is for us in that he will make sure we have a prosperous year with good finance, etc. This is a false doctrine. Hence, one can see how grossly Osteen twists this verse. But this is common with him. In Osteen's daily words of inspiration email he sends out to people, he says with respect to 2 Corinthians 4.18, Today's scripture, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Today's word from Joel and Victoria. Every obstacle in your life is subject to change. It doesn't matter what you may be facing. There is an answer in the unseen. The unseen is the spiritual realm where the promises of God exist. Your faith brings those unseen things into this natural realm. When you are fixed on something, you can't be moved. There's a determination that fuels your focus. When you fix your eyes on the unseen, the promises of God, your faith will not be moved by your circumstances, and you'll eventually see those promises come to pass. Make the decision today to fix your eyes and mind on the promises of God. Meditate on His promises until they become more real to you than the air you breathe. Declare that His promises will come to pass in your life. Declare that you have His favor. Declare that you are more than a conqueror. Don't allow fear and doubt to change what you are speaking over your life. As you continue to fix your spiritual eyes on the unseen promises of God, you will see those things come to pass in the natural, and you will move forward into the abundant life the Lord has for you." Unquote. The problem with this interpretation is that they are claiming that the unseen eternal spiritual things we are to fix our eyes on are things other than what we receive after death in heaven for obeying Christ. There is nothing in this verse about unseen spiritual things coming down to us now. In fact, the verses right before prove that these eternal unseen gifts or things are reserved for us in heaven, the context states. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal." Unquote. Therefore, this is clearly talking about not being focused on the things on earth, but instead, since our bodies are decaying, to be focused on the eternal weight of glory, heaven, or unseen eternal things in heaven. How someone can then twist this to mean that our faith brings the unseen things down to us now, when the verse doesn't even say that, I'll never know. Now, the last example of distorting scripture is the most revealing example, showing his nefariousness. Osteen takes Luke 18.27, which is about the impossibility of a rich man giving away his riches, living a holy life, fighting with sin without the strength of God, and Osteen tries to make it mean that without God, it is impossible to be successful and rich, but with God, it is possible. He twists it so it is totally backwards, Osteen states. The scripture says with, with men or with people it may be impossible, but with God all things are possible. I'm asking you today to be a believer and not a doubter. God has great things in your future. And you got to make up your mind. You're not going to get stuck in a rut. Maybe you've had a lot of victories. Maybe you've had a great life. But you know what? God wants you to go further. The passage he quoted is Luke 18.27, but what is so ironic and remarkable about trying to make this text mean that it's possible to be rich and financially successful with God's help is that the actual context of the verse is that it is pretty much impossible for those like Osteen who cling to riches to go to heaven. Here's the context, Luke 18.18-27. 18, 
And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. And he said, All these things I kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with men is possible to God." Unquote. Notice Osteen only quotes the last verse. What Jesus is saying is that although it is hard to be a disciple of Christ and forsaking worldliness and loving him more than worldly things like money, Jesus says with God it is possible to do this. It's possible to overcome worldliness and submit to holiness with God's power. That's just the opposite of what Osteen tries to make the verse mean. He tried to make it mean that with God it is possible to be happy in your worldly life of temporary success, massing great amounts of wealth. But I find it ironic that in the very context of the verse he quoted, trying to say that Jesus wants you to be rich, Jesus was actually teaching that in order to follow him, the rich man had to sell all he had and give it to the poor. Now let me just say, if Osteen knew the real context, and still misuse this text to promote prosperity despite it negating and contradicting what he was saying, the conclusion is that Osteen is very evil and doing things to the scriptures that he knows is wrong. There are many more examples of Osteen misquoting scripture, but I think that is sufficient to show his dishonesty, as well as the fact that he does not respect God's word enough to handle it accurately. He does not hesitate to twist scripture to mean what it nowhere teaches namely his false, selfish, worldly prosperity gospel. One of the main dangers of Osteen's teaching is that people end up believing Christianity is all about trusting in Jesus to give you things here on earth, or give you a happy life, not realizing that this has never been the gospel. In all of ancient church history, neither Christ nor his gospel have been presented in such a way. By falling for this type of stuff, people don't realize that they are missing out on what they are actually commanded to do, and that is to put off your old fallen selves, discard worldliness and selfish material gain, and instead strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord, believing in Christ, as Hebrews 12.14 says. Another danger that comes with Osteen's teaching has to do with false expectations. If people don't receive the material success they hope for, then they think the gospel they were taught failed and that God failed them doesn't care about them, and they end up disassociating from Christ altogether for good. Such people were never saved. Moreover, if you teach people that all the gospel is, is asking Jesus into your heart so he will give you all your temptations, as well as a luxurious life, you're idolizing material possessions and being covetous of money and things, as opposed to forsaking worldliness and submitting to Christ as the New Testament over and over demands of believers. For example, Ephesians 5.5, 5, the Apostle states, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." Unquote. Now, when it says that no one covetous will inherit the kingdom, the Greek word for covetous here is pleonektes, and it means eager for gain. Sound familiar? Now, Joel Osteen tells his followers to be proud of the material possessions that they feel God gives them. He states, You need to take pride in what God has given you, unquote. However, the Bible Osteen claims to follow says in 1 John 2:15 and 16 that, quote, Pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world, unquote. And commands us saying, Do not love the world or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him." Unquote. So when Osteen tells you to be proud of the things or possessions he wants you to think God gives you, he is teaching things contrary to what the Bible teaches. This is why he should not be a teacher or pastor. He needs to hang up his hat and repent. In a practical example, let's assume one of Osteen's followers 
does get some success while having pride in their possessions, like a new Mustang car for example, thinking it's from God and thinking that God is pleased with their life of sin and carnality. All the while, they are disobeying God, angering Him and will end up in hell, all because their preacher didn't know the gospel or teach them about repentance and denial of self. As David Jones and Russell Woodridge write in their book, Health, Wealth and Happiness, Has the Prosperity Gospel Overshadowed the Gospel of Christ? Quote, in It's Your Time, Osteen suggests, when you're in difficult times, it's good to remind God what you've done. God, I've kept my family in church. God, I've done the extra mile to help others. I've given, I've served, I've been faithful. In your own time of need, you should call in all those seeds you've sown. Contrary to Osteen's teaching here, biblical faith involves rejecting a self-righteous standard and recognize that only Christ has the power to save. Osteen's focus on a person's possibilities contradicts Jesus' statements, apart from me you can do nothing. Osteen is teaching a false gospel. Those who follow Osteen's gospel will indeed experience their best life now because tragically, they will die without having repented of sin and placing faith in the works and person of Jesus Christ. Notice how Osteen also attacks God's omniscience by saying God needs to be reminded of certain things, as if he doesn't already know all things. Now, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones defines biblical repentance that Osteen never teaches his congregation about as follows, quote, Repentance means you realize that you are a guilty, vile sinner in the presence of God, that you deserve the wrath and punishment of God, that you are hellbound. It means that you begin to realize that this thing called sin is in you, that you long to get rid of it, and that you turn your back on it in every shape and form. You renounce the world whatever the cost, the world in its mind and outlook, as well as its practice, and you deny yourself and take up the cross and go after Christ. Your nearest and dearest, and the whole world, may call you a fool, or say you have religious mania. You may have to suffer financially, but it makes no difference. That is repentance." Unquote. In conclusion, we have seen that Osteen's teachings with respect to thought power and the law of attraction, which developed into the Word of Faith movement, does not come from the Bible or from Christianity. It comes from 19th century occultists and New Agers, a false teaching that slowly crept into the church through certain wolves eventually finding its way into Osteen's pulpit. We examined the vast contrast between what Osteen teaches and does not teach with the biblical message. Namely, why it is so crucial to mention sin, hell, repentance, and submission in order to give a proper understanding of the gospel and people's need for a savior. We saw that Osteen doesn't truly believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. We saw that the biblical message with respect to the cost of discipleship is at odds with Osteen's teaching. We saw that Osteen twists the Bible horribly either due to ignorance, which means he is not qualified to teach, or due to nefariousness, which means he is satanic. And lastly, we saw the very real dangers of following Osteen's teachings. I pray that this presentation was useful, and if you're a follower of Osteen, I exhort you to leave his church and submit to Christ instead. And buy John MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, for further information on these issues. Christ has risen, he is Lord.